Hello, everyone. We've got a full house. <laughs> I can see. Um, nice to meet you all. I am Poppy Noor. I'm a columnist at The Guardian um, and a freelance journalist. I'm going to be chairing today's panel, um, which is um, about uh, the way that class is depicted in media, in documentary and factual TV. Um, and I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves. <laughs> I'm going to give them that honour. And maybe if, I, if we go from Campbell and then this way. Uh, I'm Campbell Robb. I'm the Chief Executive of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Um, I'm Jack Monroe. Um, I'm a writer and a troublemaker, generally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm Daisy May Hudson. I'm a film director, writer and housing activist. I'm Mark Raphael, I run an independent production company called 72 Films. Cool. I always feel like that's the worst bit, having to describe yourself in yeah. like one sentence <laughs> and hope that you sound important enough for everybody to keep listening. Um, <laughs> but so basically the way, the way that we're going to work, so Campbell's going to start with a bit of a discussion on the research and then we're going to broaden out and we'll take some questions at the end. Um, but yeah, so, so Campbell, do you want to start by giving a... Thank you very much. Yep, I'm happy to. Uh, it's uh, uh, great to be here and great to be on this panel. I'm a little bit daunted. Last time I saw Daisy May, she was standing up launching her amazing film, Halfway House, if you haven't seen it. Uh, every time I see a picture of her sister, it almost makes me uh, cry with happiness. I'm not going to spoil her alert. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and Jack and I, last time we were on a platform together, we were uh, uh, talking about I, Daniel Blake, uh, and with Ken Loach about how they impact. I don't know Mark, but uh, we've just been hearing about some of the stuff he's doing. Uh, what this is all about is telling stories. Uh, and what the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, tries to do and has been for about 100 years is been telling stories about poverty. Uh, we were set up in York by Joseph Rowntree, who, whilst making lots of chocolate and ruining our teeth and generally uh, doing bad things to our bodies, also uh, was terrified about what he saw around him in York. And the first thing he did in York uh, him and his son, uh, was they walked around York and tried to count the number of people in poverty in York. Uh, that's actually what they did. And then they wrote a report on that, uh, which was the start of the foundation's work in really beginning to try and tell the story of what poverty is in this country and some of the solutions to it. We do that a little bit more sophisticatedly now, uh, but not that much. Um, and what I want to talk very briefly about is, I think the stories that we tell, um, if the definition of madness is to do the same thing over and over again and expect uh, a different result, uh, then some of the stories that we've been telling about poverty, about how we tell those stories, who tells those stories, uh, have been what's happened. In the last 30 or 40 years, we've seen a very, very significant change in the way that this country views the welfare state, views the causes of poverty, and views the way that we can get out of poverty. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, many of us, probably most of us in this room, have fought against that. I've spent my whole career uh, being a troublemaker and a fighter, trying to uh, fight and expose poverty. And yet, last week, we launched a report uh, which showed that 1.5 million people in this current, uh, that last year, were in destitute at some point. What does destitute mean? Destitute means that you probably didn't have toiletries a couple of times in a week. You certainly didn't have a hot meal at least two days in a row. You probably might have slept rough. You would have certainly been to a food bank. This is not just poverty. This is at your ends of your tether. This is nothing left. This is scraping something together to have a meal or one meal a day or had enough soap so that your child can go to school uh, reasonably clean. That's what destitution is. We also launched a report at Christmas, which was the first time in two decades, two decades, um, uh, pensioner poverty and child poverty is on the rise again. <clears throat> We are still fighting a battle against poverty in this country. It exists in this country, despite myself and many other people fighting against that for a long time. And our prognosis, if you like, if we finally got one, is that the reason, partly, uh, that we can't get the change that we want to see in this country is because of the views and attitudes that have taken hold for a whole range of reasons, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of them today, about what the cause of this is. But we have a set of views about poverty in this country right now, which if we could just show uh, my clip. Hey, so on one hand, we have the most prolonged period and shrinking of the state since the Second World War. We have 1.5 million slipping into destitution. We have poverty on the rise. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, people feeling that uh, it's either people's own individual fault um, or it's too big a solve, problem to solve or it is not a big problem that needs to be dealt with. 
My granny used to tell me never to get mad, but to get even. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of, uh, she was quite scary, my granny. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, but I took that, those words uh, literally in terms of what we're trying to do now. Um, because the thing is, if we really want to change what we do in this country about poverty, we can't just sit here uh, in our closed world and say they're all wrong and we're all right. Uh, because that's just not how it works. Uh, it's not how we're going to change the mind. In fact, all the research we've done, very significant research, with about 20,000 people of which that film was part of, uh, it tells us that the more that we tell them that they're wrong, the more that they'll stop listening to us. The more that we berate them for being uh, unfeeling, unempathetic, they'll feel more uh, that other people should make the effort and do what they did, or, or save like they did, or struggle like they did to get to the top. So what we need to do is start telling a different story. Uh, and the way that we're going to start to doing that is there's a huge uh, momentum in the states at the moment around what they call framing, which is about talking about things in a different way. Uh, and the best example that I can give you is that in the states, many, many activists were pushing and pushing and pushing to get ballots on states uh, to, uh, about uh, same-sex marriages. And they'd get it on the ballot, uh, and they'd get enough votes to get it on the ballot, and then they'd have the discussion about how they would get the vote to, uh, in a statewide referendum. And they kept losing, and they kept losing, and they kept losing, one after another. I can't remember how number it was. And then when they stopped, and they went back, thought, why are we doing this? They went back out and talked to people. And what they'd been saying to people was, it's our right. It's our right. We should have the right. We should have the right to marry who we want to do. And then they started going out and saying, I should be with who I love. I should be with the person that loves me. Why can't I be the same as you? And suddenly, put numbers went up. Now, it sounds simple, but it's not. It's complicated. It's a long-term thing to do. And what we're interested in this and why we're here uh, in this and why we're supporting and trying to get this going is because we believe that we have to tell a different story in a different way with different people telling those stories. Because as long as we continue to tell those stories in the way that we're doing, it's not going to work. Really, really proud to be uh, associated with Sean McAllister's film, which premiered here this week. If you haven't seen it yet, absolutely uh, get there and see that now because in a standing piece of work talking about Hull and what's happening there, the types of work that we want to see about people talking about what it's like, sharing their stories, but not berating people, not bashing people over the head with it, telling that story as Daisy May did in her incredible film as well, about what it's like, what it is, and creating empathy for people to begin to understand. Because if you can all do that in your films, if you can tell those stories in the way, then we can come in the back of that with the policies, with the thinking, with the arguments that turn politicians, that give politicians the space to make the change to be brave, to make the things that they need to do to fix these attitudes and these problems. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Campbell. Um, it's interesting, that film, um, because, well, I don't know, but, uh, put your hands up in this room, anybody who's, who's been on benefits or has received some form of state help? And the panel? <laughs> like, quite a lot of people. I think, I think what's interesting, I mean, like, at least three people on this panel um, have chosen to reclaim that narrative, right? And, you know, Jack, in your um, writing, that's how I started writing. I started write, writing about my experience having been homeless when I was younger. Um, Daisy made a film about it. And I wonder how much of that it is in response to the way that the media narrative around poverty is cu currently. And I'd be interested to know, Campbell, but we come back to you in a bit, um, how much of what people are saying in that film is... Um, created by what they see on TV and created by what they read in, in, uh, in the news and how much of it is a kind of natural mindset. I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, but maybe if we go to you first, Jack, and talk a little bit about, I mean, do you feel that your experiences having been, I mean, maybe you, you can talk to, them, talk to them a little bit for anybody who doesn't know, but mm. do you feel that your experiences having been on benefits are depicted in the media accurately? No, not in the slightest. Um, I started writing um, an online local politics blog um, as an unemployed single mum. Um, I didn't have very much to do as an unemployed single mum, so I would go and sit in the public gallery of my local council meetings, the planning meetings, the development control meetings, the full council meetings, and I started to write about them from my point of view as a, sing as a single parent looking for work. I wanted to see the people who were making the decisions that would impact my day-to-day -day life. I wanted to see who these people were that were shutting the children's centre that I relied on for childcare for my son so I could look for work. The people who were taking away library services that we relied on for something to do on a rainy day. And I wanted to understand why they were making those decisions. So I started to write about it online. And that gradually 
well, not very gradually actually, explosively expanded into um, a first person narrative about my life as it was as a single mum on the breadline, starving, suicidal, looking for work. And it went viral for reasons unknown. Um, and <laughs> well, well, it did. I, it I, I, wrote, I wrote a piece called Hunger Hurts that, um, in July 2012, and it was, it was basically about being hungry. Um, I was putting my affairs in order because I was planning to kill myself. Um, I was making sure that my son could go to his father's. I was putting... All my, I was selling all my stuff. I was getting rid of everything that I owned because I couldn't see that my life could carry on in the miserable, dank pit of despair that it was in. So I was basically filing my life away to end it. Um, and that I didn't, I didn't declare that anywhere in that post, but I think enough people read between the lines. And I went from my 17 local readers of local politics anoraks to 2 million views overnight. Um, and life turned on its head. From there, the way that other people then chose to tell my story was completely different. Um, one newspaper described me as a single mum who had got a best-selling book deal making 9p burgers. Another one described me as feckless, tattooed, with mirrored kitchen tiles that basically brought it all on myself. One newspaper offered me a recipe column in order to write about cheap recipes for other people. Another newspaper pulled every recipe in my book to shreds. The narratives were either split into, look at this hard-working mum who's made good, or look at this feckless waster who spent all her money on body art and now can't feed her son. But what I wanted was a space to tell my own story. And I made it, I carved it out, and I continue to do so. I write frequently, not as frequently as I'd like, but other things get in the way. Um, terrifyingly, angrily, honestly, raw from the heart. I don't allow anybody else to tell my story for me anymore. I ask people if I can read, if I can read what they're writing before it goes to print, or my editor won't let me do that. I'm like, fine, you can't fucking interview then. Because I'm tired of other people framing my narrative as businesswoman of the year or feckless single mum, when actually I'm just a bit of a mess in the middle somewhere. But I'm a mess that accurately represents quite a lot of people on benefits. Quite a lot of people who's, you know, you're not planning for your future when you don't think you've got one. You don't want to go on telly and tell everyone how shit your life is when you haven't even told your own mum. It's, 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 it's a messy middle ground, but the key is to not try to tell other people's stories for them, to give them a space in order to tell their own. People can be vulnerable when they're in vulnerable situations to protect them from what happens when you suddenly shoot someone into the media. I'm still recovering five, six years later from, from being exploded into the limelight and all of the crap that gets rained on your head for it. Um, but to just allow people to tell their own stories, support them in order to do it safely, and give them a platform. Because if it's their voice and their experiences that you want, Elevate it, raise it, raise other people's voices. Don't, don't even try to tell their stories for them. And I think, um, you know, one of the things about this, I don't, I don't know how you feel about this, Daisy, but it's just so hard to tell your own story in the first place and to get your kind of mind around the all of those different narratives, right? I mean, for me, it was definitely a learning process from going from wanting to be... Uh, seen as hard, you know, like seen as hard working and I, I tried really hard and I deserve, you know, I was poor but I deserve to come out of it, to then sort of thinking, oh, I wonder how that narrative traps people like my family who are still in poverty and, you know, and, and, and it kind of is step by step and, and, and some of that, I don't know, it, it, I think that that's the, one of the problems when somebody else controls your narrative is that it, that there, there are so many complexities to poverty, to class, to, like, even how you want to be viewed by other people, as bad as that sounds, you know, like having that, like, little bit of, of sanity and control over your own story because you, you, you're you worried about how it's going to be perceived by others. Um, Daisy, when you... What, I mean, watching Halfway, I don't know how many people in, in the room have watched it, but that felt like something that you were grappling with throughout the film, was how it was going to be received by others. 
Um, I think, for, like, the motivation for first making it was just like, oh my gosh, I, I've never, I, before I was made homeless, I didn't even realise that people like me could be made homeless. I was working class, but I still, you know, I dress nice and like, like to take care of myself. And I had so many, even myself, misconceptions of what it means to be homeless or what it means to, um, to be in that situation. So it was kind of, I was, I wanted to show actually it doesn't matter in all the variations. You can, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you are in your life, you can be in that situation. And, um, and I think really it was, it was for me about showing the lived realities of what it feels like to go through that level of um, kind of uh, uh, the lived realities of those of those policies that make such a massive take have such a massive impact on our lives. We never really get to hear honest portrayals mm -hmm. of the impact of policy and these discussions. We're even you know speaking to local councils, they see us as facts yeah, as figures and numbers in a system, and um, and so for me it was really about humanising that and showing showing that my mum was the most amazing mum and and what you're saying about grappling with that thi with that thing often in society we blame the individual rather than actually turning on and questioning the system and what's like why is this happening rather than as we had so many people say like they must have done something wrong um so kind of the way i wanted to portray my mum was as someone that was like loving and had dignity and used to fold our clothes and and you know do stuff normal stuff we all do it but we don't see those representations in the media and people want to show like your, your pile of mess on the floor and not your pile of washing folded up if you've got time on the side and um and so that was definitely something and also to show my mum not as a victim um i think we see far too many two-dimensional representations of working class people particularly women as victims of a, of a system my mum was a victim of, of policy in some sense, but herself and, and her drive and her fire, she wasn't a victim and none of us were. And um, and I think when you, also, I'm probably like rambling, but also um, I think when she was made, home, when we were made homeless, particularly for a mother, it's very difficult because you're told by society that your job is to put a roof over your child's head. And when your ability to do that through no fault of your own is taken away. You feel so much shame and so much guilt and you go through every, you run through every part of your life and every decision you've ever made. And that was part of like my mum's kind of figuring out and trying to deal with everything. And she always felt like she had to be grateful. So she was grateful for the hostel. She was grateful for the council house. And that is a really, for me, a very damaging narrative that is fed into it fed into working class kind of communities is that every time we get help from the state we have to be grateful when actually you know um that issue of being grateful like we're paying rent we had to pay a lot of money for rent in a homeless hostel and you have to pay rent if you're living in a council house and you are a contributing member of society and you're a human being essentially so why should you feel grateful for having a home when you can't afford a house in the private rented market. And when we have those issues of those kind of narratives of you've got to be grateful, things like Grenfell happen, because those people were paying rent. They were arguing that um, that, the, that, that it wasn't set, there was no fire safety in the building, and yet there was an attitude, well, you know, you've got to be grateful for where you live in, so we'll get to you in due course. And then we had you know, the death of 72 people as a result of it. Um, so for me, it was kind of, I wanted to present a, an alternative to that and show that we were fighting the systems in, in the little ways that we could from a very personal perspective and that my mum had dignity and she she was three-dimensional in that and same with my sister. So I'm going to show you a clip. I'll sh should I show you one or two? Let's show the one of my mum. like her little mini forms of protest which I think is really important that, that I know so many amazing women that are fighting the system like Focus E15 mums that, and also like people taking per personal power like those tiny moments where, where you are fighting the system and we don't really get to see those representations in, in the media and that's really important and also the fact that when you are working class life is hard but it's also sometimes it's funny and sometimes if you're not laughing you're crying and it's like you know it's the, those extremes and it's colourful and like not everything's got to be 
sad and depressing and full of grief. And um, and I think when I watch TV and particularly, you know, even um, programs that came out recently about working class, even the grade is like dull. It looks like everything's just sapped of colour. Um, and so, and I think that all plays into this like victim narrative and that working class people are really sad and that's not true. We are lively and fun and like we have all the different emotions that everybody else feels and experiences. So, um, uh, yeah. And I Sorry, remember... I no, 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 it's OK. It's really good. <laughs> and I, I mean, you reminded me, actually, because I remember reading an article by you um, years ago and it was about... Do you know what it was about? It was about... Um, yes, I'm homeless, and I and you, you know, you like listed off some things like you had like a fur coat, and you drank like a bottle of Rioja whenever you wanted, and like you had some Chanel lipstick. <laughs> and I just remember, you know, and it had been years since I had been homeless when I read that thing, and it had been years since I'd been like writing about it and was grappling with it. But I just never heard somebody able to express that thing of being like, yeah, I'm poor, and I don't want to look at it. So what? You know, like the, the amount of money that I spend on a smartphone is not going to pay my rent. So yeah, I'm still going to have like. You know, and that kind of was liberating to hear somebody just kind of own it and be like, I'm not going to let other people decide how poor I have to look from now on mm. in order to, like, you know, be, be worthy of state assistance or... Yeah. And about, um, like, when I wrote this article that kind of... Um, I I, ha I hadn't told anyone that I was homeless, and then and I was still going to work, and I'd just finished uni, and I was like trying to figure out who like everything, and um and I wrote this article called I'm one of Britain's hidden homeless, and it was talking about those things that Poppy was saying, like I go to work, I wear a fur coat, I've got lipstick on, and then at night I have to go back to a homeless hostel, and um and I wrote that, and then I had a lot of amazing reactions, um people because it, it went kind of viral and people were talking about um, sending me letters and vouchers and saying, come and stay in my house, I've got a house in the country. Um, all like, so, I was like, sounds lovely, but I didn't think it would work. Um, and, uh, and then some of, the thing, some of the comments were like, I can't believe she's got an iPhone and she's homeless. Like, why doesn't she sell her iPhone? And, um, and then like comments that I was reading on, under other programs, like, how can you be on benefits and have your nails done? It's like, we all do stuff to make us feel nice. We all, like, if we're having a shitty day, sometimes we want to go and get our nails done or we want to have those moments which give us a bit of self-worth and a bit of self-love. And why, because you're living in poverty, can you not have those moments? As long, you know, you, you work it all out. But it was interesting, like, that attitude of how can you be homeless and have an iPhone? Because there's only one image that we're constantly being fed. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that's part, that was, like, the motivation of writing that writing during that period is trying to say like hidden homelessness and being um you know being a working class person there's lots of variations of us and we look very different and we have we can you know we can have iphones and and, and glitter earrings and we're still in the same situation mark you so you make uh, factual tv and you've also commissioned tv i mean mm -hmm. is there do you think that there is a i mean is it difficult to kind of portray the full million multifaceted di dimensionality of what it is to be working class have you is that something that you have struggled with how have you worked with it yeah i think it is difficult in some ways i think it's difficult to get those stories commissioned um i think when i when we started this current company 72 films i think i was i really wanted to do something about uh the working class i really wanted to do it on the bbc so I sort of deliberately targeted the people that make the decisions and said, I think you should do this, I think you should do this, I think you should do this. And I think they thought, yeah, I think we should do this. But I, didn't, I don't think they knew quite how. Mm. And so we went off and we've got this series coming up, which I'll play a clip of, Red Car. And we looked at lots of different places. And I think one of the first things we thought about was the still works to shut. Maybe we'll tell the story of the still workers. Mm -hmm. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And then we alighted on the idea of maybe, why don't we just tell the story from the kids in the town, so they're aged roughly between 15 and 25. And, and they sort of, look, the shadow is a long shadow. But it's not in their sort of day-to-day -day life. So their point of view on, on the still works was quite different to their parents, say. And so we went off and, and started filming with them, went back to the BBC, you know, and I think it had a sort of touch of optimism. It had a touch of um, positivity. And I think they were like, okay, let's try it. 
but it, it was it, these stories aren't easy because if you want to do it properly with a bit of heart there's not a lot of story in them as in a to b narrative sometimes you know and so it can be difficult to get them commissioned but um i'll play a clip um hope you like the grade um it's with um <laughs> it's with um it's about it's a kid called james who's um he's uh he's uh the eldest of seven kids his dad's inside and uh he's been given this guy ray who's like a his mentor and Ray's got him an interview. He sort of pulled a few strings, and James has turned up at his house to sort of prepare for it. It's just a sweet little clip. Have a look. What well, I mean, what is the do, do, when you're making films about about um, about people's experiences in that way? Does it do you feel a big responsibility to portray the narrative? in a way that's going to be favourable or in a way that... I mean, there's just so many questions there, isn't there, about... Um, it just feels like such a big responsibility and how do you do it properly? Mm. You know, it's true. Um, I, suppose I, I suppose with each person we film with, I think, with that series particularly, I think we started off thinking, how can we give them as much age... You know, if you could give them all the cameras and the, and the editing, you know, you would, if you see what I mean, if that could work. I think that's what, and I suppose that was underpinning the sort of creative vibe of it, is to try and say, give them as much agency as we can to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, at the same time, there is a lot of responsibility, and I think you have to think about it uh, in a way that, you know, if that was your sister or brother, how would you feel? And I think broadly, um, yeah, everyone that we film with is like, you know, that, that's, that's what happened to them over the, you know, year, two years that we were filming. So there's four episodes, and so there's about twelve different people we film with. Mm. Yeah, and I think I think it's, the thing is, is just TV, film, documentary are all such hard. Or I I, I feel like anyway. I mean, maybe I would say this because I'm a writer, but I feel like they're such hard. Um, it's such a difficult format because you do have to kind of package things up in a certain way where people are going to understand. You know, within I mean, especially if it's kind of a factual TV series that's going to be half an hour every episode that you have to kind of package people up that they're going to understand them straight away. And I think that there is kind of still a struggle um, in the media, at least at least when I have worked with um, TV or, or, or film, where people kind of, they, they want to put you in a box and they want to kind of be like, oh, we're going to portray you as this kind of person or, you know. Um, I, um, I did really want to ask um, Campbell about kind of the way forward, but maybe if we do that quickly and then if we kind of open it up to questions. Yeah, I'm just thinking that... Um, I'm kind of asking you all things one by one, and it would be nice if everybody just started to have a bit of a discussion. Um, but, but, but maybe if we, but maybe if before we do that, Campbell, if we talk a bit about, you know, can the media change the narrative? What do we need to be doing? I mean, I, I find the thing about framing interesting because the thing that it make, immediately makes me wonder is like, do you have to start describing poverty? Do you have to start describing working class experiences in a way that people are just going to like it? Is that the kind of, or you know, that they're going to be able to? Is it a kind of, is it like a public appeasement? Like, do you have to all of a sudden be the strong working class person or the deserving working class person, etc.? So you want me to do that quickly? <laughs> okay. So, the, so it's the poverty uh, p portrayal of me, uh, the poverty in the media, and the future for the last fifty years and the next fifty years, very briefly. Okay, sit down, folks. This is going to be quick. Um, so there's a number of different things I think we need to take into account. The first of which is that it's very easy. Uh, every kind of discussion that I've had about this over the last twenty five years is basically everybody ends up concluding if we just didn't have the Daily Mail, everything would be fine. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's like, and the sun, but, uh, but in, in some ways that's just a lazy way of kind of describing a wider narrative that exists. Uh, people buy papers because they reflect their opinion and vice versa. Mm -hmm. One doesn't start. One doesn't start with the other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one hundred thirty thousand people buy the Guardian, two and a half million people buy the Mail. There's a reason for those things happening. Uh, so it's easy to blame uh, the kind of portrayers of those kind of those things and that mm -hmm. uh, and there's a part truth in that but public attitudes towards the welfare state to taxation they have changed significantly since the war and that's not just to do with the media that's to do with the way that we live our lives our families our own possessions what we want from life and how we want to do that so there's a whole range of different things that have to do so I think that the way to go forward however is that what we have to start doing is 
there's been a relentless, relentless attack on the, the role of the state, the role of the individual, the individual narrative whose responsibility it is for where it is. Everything that Jack is talking about, Daisy's mum was talking about. Uh, and in a sense, that's happened for a long time, and that's been concerted through papers, through political parties, where, where we got to a point where you could have a narrative in this country which was just about strivers and shirkers. You could literally split the country down to people who deserved to get on and those who didn't. And the thing about that is that's all of our responsibility to push back against that. That's not just because it's created by things. It is about all of us taking responsibility for taking that on. That film just reminded me of taking my steps on last week to an apprenticeship. Uh, he, got, he got up late. He missed his train. I had to drive him an hour in my pajamas to get him to his <laughs> apprenticeship interview. You know, uh, but he's not, he's not from Red Car. He lives with me in London. He's, you know, he's got that opportunity, but it happens to everyone. So we've all got a responsibility to tell those stories in a different way. The frame is interesting that I just to finish because we did a lot of work and, and we talked to and the people that work with us are they're not media people they're ethnographers they're sociologists they're kind of really really and the thing that you get to is when a lot of the people that we talk to start with that attitude then we've got another film uh, which when when we've really worked with them I was gonna say worked on them but let's say worked with them uh, uh, and they change their whole narrative they start talking about it as if it's their idea and the one that worked most is it's really, there's a physical reaction. We talk about being trapped in poverty. It's what everybody that we talk to talks about. The sense of you cannot escape, you're in the spiral. You know, Daisy May's film is just a perfect example of what it's like to be homeless and to be in that time. You cannot get out. And when we really explain that to people, the people who had those attitudes, they went, yeah, they're trapped. They had a physical reaction to it. They actively could see, they could visualize what it was like to be trapped. They could see how their lives could become like that. So if I'm looking for one thing, I'd say it's empathy. How do we create empathy? How do we create a means by which you tell stories which people give the chance to look through that lens, not see Daisy's iPhone or her nails or her fur coat and see her story? And that's what we have to do and that's what you have to do and that's what we have to do together. Is that short enough? Yeah, yeah. I've just got a point. Yeah. Just on like, are we talking about solutions now? Yeah. I do think, um, and it's potentially a bit controversial, but if we think about the um, TV industry, the film industry, how many accents like uh, ours do you hear in it? I can walk into entire, like, entire floors of entire buildings and never really hear someone that sounds like me. And that, you know, when we talk about diversity and things like that, like we need people that are working class in the commissioning seats. We need people that are working class that are making the films. And not just these schemes that like bring in a working class young person in Once for a week year, yeah. and then we go oh they're great but I don't think we've got the space to hire them like no we need to be starting making proactive change because actually that's really exciting and that is that's going to be not we shouldn't see it as quotas or like something we've got to do we should see it as something actually vital and progressive for the future um, and I think it, it is the responsibility of everyone that if you are not working class you should be and you're working in the media you should be trying to outreach to make sure that you're Office is more of a representation of all of society and not just reflections of yourself. And then we start to see changes on screen as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, because I think like it even just changes the lens of what you think is interesting. Like, I don't really think it's that interesting looking like making TV shows about poor people all the time. I want to see I want to see TV shows about rich people. I want to know how they live. I want to put the spotlight. Like, you know, like I, I just guess that there's a kind of um, like one of the questions that I have as well in general is like do do we even need to keep on telling the story of working class Britain I mean like in some ways I think it's very important to shine a light on austerity and it's very important to challenge power but do we all you know like is there kind of part of it that's a bit the answer is because other people are telling it so that you know the other people are telling it now and they're telling a different story of it yeah. so until until they start telling a different story we have to keep telling the stories that we're telling because we got to push. You got to push back at some point. Mm. It's exactly if we can make other people tell all of those stories, then you don't need to do it. Mm. We're not at that stage yet. I yeah. don't think. And the Jack and Daisy's experiences and that, which is one that's welcome, is a particularly. There's a secondary thing, which is the misogyny that comes particularly when it is towards women as yeah. well. I think, mm. which is kind of layers on to this when working class women are particularly become, uh, you know, strong and we can have their voice. There's an extra layer to that, which is on top of this. I've got nothing to add really. I've, I've been told countless times that I would, I'd have my own cooking series if only I'd lose my accent. Um, 
I'm a bit too coarse and common for most people. So I tried it for a while, and I went all nice whenever I went on the radio. And I just couldn't fucking keep it up. <laughs> I just couldn't. And, and, and as you say, we need more working class people on our screens. We need them behind our screens because, you know, we're bright, we're funny, we're, we're, we're smart. We've, we've, you know, we might not have GCSEs, but we've, we've got creativity. We've got our own life experiences to draw on. We've got, we've got our own... I nearly said University of Life there, but then I sound like every other, other Facebook wanker. But it's, you know, it's, we've, got, we've got our stories to tell, but we're not given the opportunities to tell them. And a lot of the time, people, people hear me talk and they think I'm thick. And I'm like, I've got two honorary doctorates, mate. What have you done? <laughs> it's like, it's, it is, it's, 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 it's a real snobbery. And you can't just roll on the odd northern accent and think that that makes, makes your programme interesting, because it doesn't. It's mm -hmm. not. It's not. It's not enough. People aren't doing enough in order to allow us to tell our own stories. We don't need. We don't need. You know, to be a bit less rough around the edges. We need to be exactly who we are. Yeah. Jack, do you feel like you? I mean, being being able to write from your perspective and about your experiences and to tell. I don't want to say. I mean, I don't want to say your story because I hate it when people say your story. But like, you know, basically just to be yourself and be like, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm going to write. Do, do you feel like that has changed public perceptions? Do you get any feedback about that? Do you feel like it's been useful? Oh yeah, I get told I could never have been properly poor because I can string a sentence together. <laughs> I get told that on a fairly regular basis. Well, I've obviously yeah. had an education, or well, you you haven't really known poverty because you liked poetry. I was like, well, you know, well, the thing is, when you've got no money, the, th the only thing you can really do is go to the library and read books, so you do get a little bit smart, actually, no, because it's all... No, well, not... <laughs> kept, all right. <laughs> it's all cool, stuff. In my day... Yeah. <laughs> back in my day, we had libraries. Exactly. <laughs> but that's... But, you know, that's... There are so many misconceptions about what it's like to be poor, what it's like to be working class, and people do. It's not just fur coats and iPhones, it's... It's an education. It's yeah. it's knowing words of more than two syllables. It's being able to write. It's anything nice. Yeah, yeah. no, it's anything you nice. Poor people can't have nice things. Nice. That's that's the, that's the, that is the narrative. It always has been the narrative, <laughs> and it's the narrative we're looking to change. But we have a we have a we have a. If you're a single under twenty five at the moment, and you're on job seekers allowance, by our definition, you are even at that point, you are destitute because you literally are not given enough money to cover the essentials that the British public would say that you needed to live on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the state is, so, and, and then at that point, we take those persons, and if they miss a bus, they get sanctioned. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, they, if, they, if they don't do well at an interview, they get sanctioned. Mm -hmm. They get money taken, when you have less than £30 a week and you're getting money taken away from you, yeah. and if you don't pay your bills, you get them reclaimed. The, the council will send bailiffs to take money back off of you. That is the reality of life, and that is what is happening to people across the country all the time. So that is a story that isn't told. That is a story that has to be told in a different way, but one that isn't about pity, that one that isn't about... Mm -hmm. that is the, do we really believe in a society that that's kind of society? Society we live in, and actually, most people don't believe that. Most people don't believe that that's the society they want to live in, but they also kind of can't quite believe that it's actually happening, or it's happening to other people, or it's happening to people not like them. Mm. So it's those stories that, and exactly what's happening, you know, that red car is just a, that's just that's just a story happening every town in every place. Mm. Mm. Apprenticeships are very complicated as well, particularly yeah. in you know, there's a girl we filmed. She was living with her father. She got an apprenticeship, a two-year apprenticeship at the local mechanic shop, but she was on £2.40 an hour. Yeah. And as soon as she qualified, she would have to go up to minimum wage. And he, you know, he wasn't going to pay a minimum wage. So then she's like, nowhere to go. I mean, she got a job, luckily, a quick fit. But you know, that, that process is so bust, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And, and I think that area and that, the apprenticeship is, is, a, is another way of keeping people out of you know, earning a living. It's, it's a, a complete con. I was told at 21, when I was looking for work, I went into um, a local hairdresser's and, ironically, quick fit. Um, I thought I'd look good as a mechanic. Um, I thought, <laughs> I, I, I'm good with my hands. I thought I could do that, you know. Um, and um, I was told at 21 that it was cheaper to have 16-year-olds um, on apprenticeships because they'd have to pay them less. And this hairdresser put this notice up for an apprentice about every two or three weeks. And every single time it became a bit of a vendetta, I'd go in and go... 
do you, do you still need an apprentice? No, no, you're too old, you're too old. And, and they wouldn't say it. I mean, he was just like one man with a business, so he was quite free to go, oh, no, you're too old. The government are going, oh, no, you can get an apprenticeship. You're, you're, you're under 25. And I'm like, I really fucking can't. I've, I've tried. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't take it. They wouldn't, down the job centre, they wouldn't take it. They wouldn't accept that you'd applied for apprenticeships and been told that you were too old for one because they, it's cheaper to hire 16-year-olds. I am conscious that I promise people questions. Um, so please do start putting your hands up. I can't tell how... OK, we, we have one already. There we go. <laughs> He's probably been itching the whole time. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, one for Mark uh, by Red Car. Um, uh, Mark, you were saying um, you... It's, it's really about creative control, actually. I wanted to know, with your contributors in that yeah, film, yeah. Um, did they get a, a viewing at the yeah. end? And were they able to feed back? Yeah. How did you deal with some of the things they came back with? Uh, everyone had a viewing, yeah. Um, we basically, let's say they had four elements of their story, we'd put their story on a timeline and they'd watch that. Um, yeah, I mean, they were there, you know, they came comments or why did you put that in or what's that about? But by and large, they were, you know, incredibly happy. But there was a bit of, you know, oh, I don't like that shot of me wearing that t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sorry about that. Just the trivial stuff. Yeah, yeah, there was nothing, you know, profound. But it was it was something that we all wanted to do, you know, and we showed the council and, you know, the people that were involved in, in you know, being part of the process of us being up there. We were up there for about 18 months, all told. So, yeah, we got to know everyone. So that was sort of part of the process. Thank you. Is your filmmaking process quite collaborative? In terms of the, the contributors? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't say it was like uniquely so, if you see what I mean. Um, I suppose I just think if someone's going to let me in, I'd like it to be fair and I'd like it to be, I'd like them to watch it back. Uh, I'd hate them to think, gosh, I, I really regretted taking part in that. That's just, that's, you know, so I think we try and be sort of consistent with them throughout the whole process. Um, but I think that's fairly, I mean, it depends what type of companies you work for, but a lot of the better factual companies, I think, in that same vein. I mean, this is to everyone. How much do you feel that time is a factor in telling uh, stories honestly? Because having made quite a few myself, um, it's often a struggle trying to get the budgets to film for six months. I would say less than six months isn't real or fair. Mm. Should I answer that? I mean, I don't know if you want to answer that. I think it's a question of money. I mean, look, and, yeah, in, in terms of te television, yeah, I think you, you, the money dictates how much time you have to film. Uh, that's completely true. I think the other thing about telling stories, I think you were sort of touching on this earlier, probably, it's like the framing device, how to tell a story is difficult, because if nothing happens, uh, what am I going to do? And so often that's why you end up following the kid who's going to shoplift or uh, the guy who's going to take some drugs or whatever because I've got something happening, I've got a story there. And so that's why you end up with that slightly skewed portrayal. Um, that's just sort of part of the process of the d director and the people on the ground feeling a bit of pressure that they need to come back with something that makes sense. But I would say you could choose not to film that. True. So no, of course you can. It depends like what your what your agenda is and, and you can choose to like the way we talk like the programs that we have about poverty like are we talking about po a person that's poor are we talking about a person who is just living in the context of poverty sure. like what we can choose what to film which makes them film three dimensional and that could you could get that in two weeks but it, you've just got to spend enough I guess you just have to really think about like how it's again framing it's like they are people and we want to show them as three-dimensional, but they're in the context of poverty rather than I'm going to shoot all the things that make them look poor. Mm -hmm. And I get, and, it, and, I, and I think as well, it's about what people find juicy, juicy, and what they. Find. I mean, one of the things that I found really interesting watching Benefit Street. I mean, obviously, it's an awful program, but what one of the things that I found. <laughs> sorry if anyone here in here made it. <laughs> I'm not get sorry. Out. <laughs> yeah. um, but one of the things that I found amazing about it is there's this scene in it where. Um, and actually, it happens a few times where everybody's sharing this one laptop, right? And uh, and they're trying. I mean, it feels like the way it's being depicted is like, oh, look at these, you know, poor feral people. They've only got one laptop between like five different families. 
And I just thought, for me, it reminded me of like amazing working class solidarity that you know that I had growing up with the people around me. Was that like if you didn't have like some sugar or you didn't have money for dinner or whatever, you'd go and knock on your neighbour's door and they'd look after you. If you didn't have a laptop, they'd let you borrow it. You know, like, I don't know how many middle-class people would lend me their laptop, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and I don't know, yeah, so I, go, I suppose it's kind of, like, yeah, it's that thing as well, isn't it, of, like, do you choose to see things as deserving of pity or do you, do you choose to see them as, like, really strange, abnormal things because because the person behind the camera finds them really strange and abnormal or is there a way of seeing that in a more empathetic and a more positive way? I've had um, numerous um, TV people in my house rifling through my kitchen cupboards at various points in my career and the things that they find fascinating <laughs> fascinates me. They, they were, Can you just move a few tins out of that, please? Your cupboard's a bit full. And I'd be like, I write cookery books now. I'm not actually <laughs> poor anymore. You don't have to just turn all the smart price labels around just to get your shot. You can just... You can just show that I actually have food, that's fine. Or they'll be looking at like little knickknacks I've picked up from charity shops. They'll be like, oh, these are quite interesting, aren't they? And you're just like, honestly, you're here to talk to me about my book. You're not here to make my cupboard look any more empty or find my most battered saucepan to sit on the top <laughs> or ask me to roll my sleeves up so you can really see my working class tattoos in all their glory. You just, just, do, just do your job. Just don't, don't try and frame me as anything other than exactly what I am and please put my tins back in my cupboard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this lady here and then this lady here. And then this this um, you're, you mentioned you had 18 months in red car. Was that anticipated from the beginning, 18 months, or was that the length of time it took to make it for narrative reasons? Um, the latter. Um, yeah, we're quite overspent. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we, we uh, it took longer to make than we anticipated. It took longer to edit than we anticipated. Um, but I don't think we, you know, we, we were never up against a sort of transmission deadline. So it was like off you go. And sort of halfway through production, for no, I, I, you know, we had lots of conversation with the BBC, but they originally commissioned three 60 minute programmes. And then halfway through, they said, can we have four 45 minute programmes? Which naturally meant we had to film for a bit longer. Even though it's the same duration. Um, the, this lady here, do you still have a question? Yeah. And then this gentleman here on the corner, if he still wants to. Yeah. It's kind of a question, kind of more of a point, I suppose. Just going back to what you were saying, I think about, you know, it, it's like we need, we need these, um, we definitely need these films from people that live or have lived that life at some point and have that direct experience. I think that's really important because if we don't have them, we're not going to have the empathy and we're not going to change the minds of, of the people that need, you know, need to understand things differently. And I was walking in yesterday and walked past a policeman who was talking to two homeless people on the street and he was actually trying to be nice, like he wasn't meaning to be horrible or patronising, but he actually said to them, all I heard was, you just need to pull yourself together, work hard, and everything's up to you. And I literally turned around and looked at him with... I, I, just, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and I just thought... The thing is, he believes that to be true, because most people do. And believes that to be the kindest thing to say. That. Exactly. And it's like, so, you know, we do need to keep having these films and programmes, but I do think they need to come from from people that have lived that life and that do have that experience, we need to tell, like you said, they need to tell their own stories. I think that's really important. So thanks for, for all that. And also maybe in a way, I mean, I think, thought it was interesting in what you were saying, um, Campbell, about kind of people sometimes watching these stories and feeling that people are trapped. And I think one of the thing that, things that's amazing about Halfway, and actually I mentioned it recently at the, um, the Cardboard Citizens remake of Cathy, was... You know what is amazing about that story is you challenge it, and you know in the end, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm ruining it for everyone, but you should have watched it already. Um, <laughs> but you know, but you you show you, you're basic. You know, you and your mum and your sister are like we're not gonna we're not gonna take this, and you know in the end you win. And I think um, yeah, that's uh, it's kind of a side point, but it just just made me think as well about you know it's kind of showing the structural challenges and like how hard it would be for that guy, but also like there are roots. For people and they can challenge and they can be powerful. 
Yeah, hiya. Um, this is very much towards Daisy, uh, which I thought you made a fantastic point, and you are such a fucking breath of fresh air, kid. <laughs> you really are. You really are. Uh, listen, I, I teach at University of Westminster. I'm also a television drama director, and clearly, self-evidently, I am a scouser. The People's Republic of Liverpool. Um, <laughs> I would say we have 25% of our students you roughly call or would self-identify as working class. They don't do well on graduation. They, don't, they can have good work experiences, but they seem to fail to build those relationships with companies. I'd love to know what the panel think is going on there. What is happening? They're all good students. You know, some get first, some get two ones, some get two twos, whatever. They're all good practice-based students who want to direct but something's disconnecting. It's just not working compared to what happens for outcomes for other students. I think it connects to what you were saying earlier mm -hmm. and the kind of ecology of what they're mm -hmm. trying to graduate into. And I'd just really like to know everyone's thoughts on that because I think this is the heart of the fucking problem. Yeah. Really, really. The answer is nepotism, really, isn't it? Because I think that, um, you know, people, it's all about it's not, we're not saying people don't have good intentions all the time. Like, probably you'll have people that work in the industry that hear about their niece, their, daughter, their sister's niece that wants to get into filmmaking, and they think, that's a really great idea, I'm going to get her in. But probably you come from the same class and the same social circles. So every time you put your hand out to someone young, it's usually within your own class and your own system so it is a nice thing to do but also we do have to be active about going outside of that that situation and like now I'm, I'm a filmmaker but the way I got into it was by going out and um well I didn't know I was going to be a filmmaker whilst I was filming my homeless experience but it turns out then it was turned into a feature doc and now that's what what I do but that was I had to go independently because I don't think I would know who to how to get in really and um and even like the life of the film has really been about was really opened up by um i was i was awarded bafta breakthrough brit which is like where you get set up meeting bafta set up meetings with, with you so you can sit opposite for lunch with like people that i couldn't even i, would, I don't think they'd even open my email and then I, suddenly i'm sitting opposite them and i can prove to them that i you know i'm they might want to work with me and kind of, and so like that scheme was really really important but how many people have access to that scheme because there's only a limited number so that's my um, and so yeah that and then that was probably the, how we got halfway made and kind of like into and it did so well was because people that were suddenly around me started helping out and like really offering a hand and because they believed in the story and they believed in us and, and that was really important but if you don't have access to that then, then that's very difficult so I completely understand what you're saying and how do we change that is by think everyone being really really thoughtful about who they're, who they're opening up to um, can we just, we've got like just a few minutes left, so maybe if we take, actually, we're, I mean, we're, we're pretty much finished, but, but maybe if we just take a, a, a few, que three questions at once. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, the term that seems to have not been mentioned, which for me, I've made several films of poverty through the eyes of children, eyes of child and friend like kids, which I'm four, and there's a thing that I've tried hard, with, you know, the battle is, is showing social mobility. It's that essence of social mobility, which is the bit about being trapped in poverty. It's a bit about but how do you get from there to here? And I think that in terms of also televisually, it's a very hard to show that. It's really hard to show why the bottle of wine on one night, like as we all know, you're not allowed to drink, smoke, have any vices if you're poor. But how do you show to an audience who doesn't get it that that one bottle of wine is not going to pay the rent? You know? And I think that is the challenge. The challenge is how we depict social mobility in the media and how you can move out of poverty into non Well, you just let the person whose bottle of wine it is explain why they've got it. <laughs> social mobility in this country now is absolute bollocks. You get trapped in poverty, you're basically stuck there unless you write a best-selling book, create a BAFTA award-winning film or, or, or get lucky. Um, it's, it's something that has got that was shit when austerity hit in 2008 and it's just getting worse. Brexit's going to make it even worse. And it's, it's a story that unfortunately doesn't have a happy ending, so it doesn't make brilliant telly unless your protagonist does top themselves in the bath and then, yeah, you've got a telly programme out of it. 
So the, the, reason why, the reason why nobody asks why you've got a bottle of wine, why you've got an iPhone, why you've got a fur coat, why you haven't sold everything you own, why you've got tattoos on your arms. And it comes back to that thing about letting people tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. And you allow someone to a five-minute explanation, a five-second explanation, well, that bottle of wine wouldn't pay the rent. And suddenly, that's, that's what your viewer gets. That's what people understand. And they stop going and bitching in their little circles about the iPhone and the fake nails and the tattoos because someone's explained it to them in one sentence that that wouldn't have paid the rent. So and that's what it's about. It's giving people the opportunity to not explain themselves because none of us owe anyone an explanation, but to be able to tell our stories. And the details that, that you might not think are important are actually the questions that really do need to be asked. Mm, yeah, and I mean, I'm going to turn that on its head slightly a little as well in that I think maybe one of the reasons why we still ask those questions about the bottle of wine or the smartphone is because we still believe in social mobility like that's how yeah. it happens like I mean I'm not sure whether social mobility is always something I don't know like it is the idea that everybody can move on from their circumstances well then what happens to people who can't like, there are always going to be people who work in jobs that aren't paid incredibly high salaries or even good you know decent salaries so is the, the route to, to addressing that saying, well, they just need to move up? Or is it saying, well, actually, maybe we should offer something for everyone? Yeah, my... Oh, no, Can you go just... No. Uh, why, does the, why are we only interested if they're going to be, like, some shining star that breaks out of it? Like, we... That's, again, is the trappings of, uh, like, dominant yeah. narratives that mm -hmm. we're only interested in you if you're able to move up and really prove that, you know, poverty is not a thing. And so I think... It's about, like, if we are going to make films about poverty, not necessarily we've got to make them about social mobility, but about human relationships. Like, why are they the best brother in the world? Or, like, what makes them, um, you know, what's their favourite thing that gets them through a situation? Like, that, we need to, like, reframe it in those ways. What are those small things that actually <coughs> to, are, like, big things to people that are living in poverty? I, I, I was going to say, I think there's there's two things. One of which is that we all have a responsibility. It, it, Daisy May said it earlier on, is that every time you see poverty in, in film, it's like they've seeped out all the colour. So that it kind of, it's a, we, our job is to put the colour back in, uh, uh, to kind of into those stories and to, to those things. But the thing is, it's that narrative is, it's, you all want a story to tell, and that's fine. I'm not really interested. I'm interested in numbers. If you start a poor paid job now, in 10 years' time, you're going to still be in a poor paid job. That job isn't going to pay all the costs that you have in your life. Even now, if you fulfil what you're supposed, what the the system, the narrative is, is that you work hard, then you'll be able to look after yourself and your family. That doesn't happen anymore. For most people in this country, they work hard and they've got three jobs before they can even cover their things. So there's a different narrative arc. There's a different story being told all the time, and it's putting that colour back in, telling and allowing people to tell their stories and to do that. We have to break a whole set of systems about who gets what opportunities to do what, but we can do a whole other kind of session about uh, about that. But it's absolutely about our job is to put that colour in and then, then tell those stories because the, the, it's changed. The world has changed. There isn't social mobility in the same yeah, way. So People true. work really hard and they're still poor uh, and they're still losing their homes and they're still not being able to feed their kids. That's the reality of the stories that we need to tell. So, can I, can I say, why is there so much hostility towards the benefits of the street? Because it doesn't tend to tell the whole story. It's not a sort of dynamic, but it doesn't tend to tell the whole story. But so much of what you guys have, uh, seem to be asking for in terms of colour and community support and you know, refusing you know, to drive, overly drink when the cameras are in front of them, that, that, that show thought all that. And it had some spirit to it. That show fed into a very dangerous narrative that people on benefits are feckless, irresponsible... Um, and it didn't allow people to tell their own stories. It was irresponsible in the way that it set people up to fail deliberately for the cameras. It is um, a show that has done damage to um, the reputations of everybody who is in receipt of welfare benefits, and it was, in my opinion, a hostile and irresponsible um, series and should not have been commissioned. Also, if you're like trying to get access to working class people now, because you're making a new documentary, and you approach them, they'll say, oh, it's not going to be like Benefit Street, is it? Mm. So that is the reality. What, what Benefit Street did was completely create a lot of mistrust from working class communities to the industry, which has actually made our jobs harder now to be able to tell those... 
Was it the show or the hysteria around the show? I don't know. I didn't ask them that much, but uh -huh. they, if, if the majority, I can tell you, I've spoke to a lot of, lot, a lot of people, um, working class people, and they have said the same thing. Uh, just go back to the point I was trying to make earlier on. Why, you know, should we just, it was your point, should we just stop doing this and it'll kind of, we stop making these? Because there is a, there's a, there's, there's an, you know, all forces have an equal and opposite, in fact, in this case, stronger reaction. Uh, the film is, whether itself or the film is good, the environment in which it is put in, uh, in one which is hostile uh, to, to the type of environment that we're talking about, is, has a political agenda that wants to portray things in a different way, wants to reduce the state, wants to reduce people's responsibility for supporting it. If you put stuff, if you are a filmmaker and you put that out into that space, that is what's going to happen. The type of feedback that Jack and Daisy and other people get when they when they oppose what is the dominant narrative, and that's 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 one of the responsibilities that we all have. But we have, when we're telling people, start helping people tell their own stories, is you got to protect them at shelter when we were at shelter when wherever we were working with people who have been homeless our first thought was how do we protect these people from the shit that's going to land on their head uh, uh, from on Twitter on Facebook and all of those kind of things because we got to protect people from what's coming so telling stories in this environment until we change the nature of the way that that story is told then we have to protect people in that environment because otherwise they will get eaten alive by the types of things that come out of people because generally I mean people think like if you're working class a lot of my mates the first time I went on telly on BBC Breakfast, I borrowed a suit jacket off my nan and went to talk about, you know, talk about my life and I put my nice posh voice on. And everyone thought it was wonderful. Oh, you, you got to go on telly. So if you, if you turn around to people who are, you know, who are inherently poor, who are working class, for a lot of people, being on telly is an aspiration. So you give them that golden goose, they'll let you lay all the fucking eggs it likes with absolutely no thought whatsoever of what's about to happen. Because the environment you are putting that into is hostile. People are looking for things to hate, demonise, despise, troll on Twitter. And you have a responsibility to the people that you thrust onto television screens in front of millions of viewers to stop and think, what would the worst bottom feeders at the Daily Mail say about this? Because that stuff can be absolutely life-destroying. I've deliberately kept all my closest friends and family out of the press, not because I've got massive drug habits or huge big secrets in my closet to hide, but because I would not put anybody that I love through the absolute hell of being in the glare of the public eye. And when you are approaching vulnerable people and vulnerable communities and asking them to project themselves into people's television screens, you need to make sure that you've got systems in place to portray them fairly, accurately, and support them through all the shit that is going to come their way, because it will. Do you want to say something? No, I suppose I was just going to say that with that, you made a good point earlier. It's like you, you looked at that scene in a very different way to someone else would look at that scene. And I think that's, you know, it's going back to what the guy was saying, it's like mm -hmm. how, you, how you look at something, you know, the Daily Mail might look at that scene in a completely different way to you saw mm -hmm. community there. You know, they might say, you know, they're, they're being feckless. And so I think that's another layer to it. That I think that show just caught fire. And, and it was just, you know, I just wanted to say that I echo what you were thinking about. That. Cool. Shall we wrap up now and give everybody um, <laughs> on the panel? Is everyone feeling inspired? <laughs> <What's> that? <laughs> Thank you.